Amen. All right, John chapter 19. Happy Easter, everyone. So John chapter 19, of course, a very sad uh, chapter in the Bible, talking about the trial and the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, you know, we're going to talk about um, that whole thing um, tonight, or this morning, I'm sorry. Um, but J John chapter 19 pretty much details um, the whole thing out for us. You know, very, um, we'll go through that a little bit um, this morning. But what I really want to talk about in the sermon this morning is I want to talk about, I want to focus on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I mean, it's Easter. I mean, that's what Easter is about. You know, everybody um, a couple days ago celebrated, or a day and a half ago celebrated Good Friday. And, you know, we're, Garrett and I were kind of joking. It's like, okay, Good Friday, and then a day later, um, you know, Jesus rise from the dead, and, you know, after he'd been in the grave for three days. It's like, what? <laughs> what? Um, of course, Jesus was crucified, was, you know, dead in the tomb for three days and three nights. And what we're going to talk about tonight, the title of the sermon this morning is, Why the Resurrection? So we know we're going to go through the trial, the death, and the burial of Jesus Christ. But I really want to focus on and apply um, this morning, you know, why the resurrection? And that's the question that I want to answer for you on this Easter. Okay, so we see in John chapter 19, you know, this, this cruel trial of Jesus Christ. So let's first look at the, the history of it. Let's look at Jesus' trial, his, um, his death. And then I want to answer the question for you this morning and this Easter of why the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why was it necessary? Okay? So let's first look at the death. Let's first look at the death of Jesus. Now turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Just to get some context of the resurrection, let's look at the death and the burial of Jesus Christ this morning. Let's look at the death. Go to 1 Peter chapter 2. Now the death is pretty easy to understand if you understand the concept in the Bible of the death of Jesus Christ. But turn to 1 Peter chapter 2 and let's just go over it real quickly. So what was the purpose for it? What was the purpose for the death of Jesus? And the purpose was this. In 1 Peter chapter 2, look at verse 21. The Bible says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were he healed. So Jesus, it says here in 1 Peter chapter 2, he had no sin, he did no sin, in verse number 22. And I'll use um, verse number 24 a lot, out soul winning. You know, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. That we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes we were healed. So Jesus basically took all the sins of the world upon himself. He bare our sins in his own body on the tree, on the cross. Okay, turn to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John, I mean chapter 2, I'm sorry. 1 John chapter 2, and look down at verse number 2. So basically in 1 Peter chapter 2, we see this idea that Jesus, he just took the sins of the world upon himself. He could do it because he had no sin himself. He did no sin, the Bible says. In 1 John chapter 2, look at verse number 2. The Bible says, and he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So here we see this word propitiation. Now, I won't usually use this one out soul winning. It's a little bit more in depth. It's a little bit more deep. But basically what propitiation means is appeasement. He was the appeasement for our sins or atoning sacrifice. Okay, so we see that there's all this symbolism in the Old Testament about sacrificing animals. We talked about it Wednesday night, about sacrificing the two birds. You know, there's many different sacrifices that picture the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for the sins of what? Of the whole world. Okay, so anybody has access to this atoning sacrifice. Sins of the whole world. It's very clear. Okay? I mean, think of it this way. When you think of propitiation, think of it this way. It was, the, it was the appeasement of God. It was the only thing that would appease God. Think of it this way. You borrow someone's car, 
I mean, this isn't a good analogy. There's no analogy that's going to be good for this. But you borrow somebody's car, and you wreck their car, you smash their car, you total the car, and then you pay them back with like a pencil or something. That, that's the equivalent of us trying to, you know, earn our way to heaven or, you know, pay for our own sins. We can't do it. It's not even close. It's not the right, it's not the right appeasement. God doesn't want that appeasement. Okay? The appeasement, the only appeasement that God would accept was a sinless sacrifice, which is why God had to provide that propitiation himself. Okay? So, 1 John chapter 2 shows us that Jesus was the appeasement or the atoning sacrifice. Turn to John chapter 3. John, you know, a, a, atoning appeasement of what? Right? I mean, appeasement means to, you know, calm someone's anger or to make someone satisfied who's not currently satisfied with you. Right? That's what the word appeasement actually means. Look at John 3, 36. Another great soul winning verse. Probably my favorite soul winning verse right here. John 3, 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but what? But the wrath of of God abideth on him. So the Bible says here, I love, you know, John 3, 36, because it's so, it's two, it's two sentences, right? Or it's, it's one sentence. But basically, it's basically two phrases, and it explains the whole gospel right there, yeah. right? And I don't usually focus a lot on the last part, but this is what needs to be appeased, is this wrath of God that abides on you. So if you're not saved, this morning, if you're not saved this, this Easter, you say not saved, it means if you have not totally trusted on, believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, alone, period, 100%, nothing in yourself, only on Jesus, if you've not done that, I, I hate to tell you, but the wrath of God abides on you. That is what the propitiation, that is what Jesus' death did. It satisfied, it appeased that wrath that we see in John 3, 36. So look, if you get to a point in your life or at the end of your life and you do not believe on the Son, then, unfortunately, that wrath will abide on you forever. For eternity. I mean, that's, I mean, that, that's a scary thought. But that's why we need, when we explain the gospel to people, they need to understand how scary that thought is. That how eternal God's wrath is. Just like eternal life, is eternal. God's wrath, if you do not believe on the Son, is eternal. Okay? So let's look at the death itself. Turn to John chapter 19. Go back to John chapter 19. John chapter 19, the chapter that we just read. Let's start in verse number 1. Where the Bible says this, it says, Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. So basically, Jesus had already been before Herod. He had already been arrested. He had already been before Herod. He had already been before the high priest. Jesus had already been, been severely beaten at this point. Then Pilate takes Jesus and he scourges him. And the soldiers put, platted a crown of thorns and put it on his head and they put, him, put on him a purple robe. In Matthew, we talked about this on, on Wednesday as well. In um, the book of Matthew, it talks about a scarlet robe. So pur purple, scarlet, Similar, dark red color. You know, they were making fun of him that he said he was the king of the Jews. Okay? And said, Hail, king of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and said unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Turn to Isaiah chapter 50. Isaiah chapter 50. So just picture the situation here. Okay, it's much worse than these, you know, few sentences tell us. I mean, Isaiah 50 actually, you know, shines a little bit more light on what Jesus actually went through here. But at this point where he is standing, he's been scourged, he has the crown of thorns on his head, they have already put the robe on him, and he's standing in front of Pilate again, and Pilate says to the Jews, here he is. At this point, Jesus is probably near death. He has been beaten half to death at this point. Okay, turn to Isaiah chapter 50 and verse number 6. You say, where do you get that? I'm going to show you. I get it from the Bible. Isaiah 50 and verse number 6. The Bible says in this prophecy of Jesus Christ, it says, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Turn to Isaiah 52. It says that his beard was pulled out of his face. And that was another thing that was done to shame people. 
You know, the beard was a, was a, 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 a source of pride for a man. And to pull out a man's beard was something that was done to shame him or to cut off a man's beard. You remember the, the, the men the da that David sent? And what did they do? They shaved half their bodies, half their beards off. That was to shame them. That was to shame them and cause them great shame. Turn to Isaiah chapter 52. But they did not shave Jesus. They plucked out the hair of his face. Turn to Isaiah 52. Look at verse 14. And the Bible says this was the result of that. So imagine this. This is the Jesus that is standing in the robe and the crown of thorns next to Pilate right now. The Bible says, as many were astonished at thee. It says they were astonished even looking at him. Astonished. Why were they astonished? His visage, his visage, his face, his image, his face was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. That says that his, his face and his body was so marred at this point that it was marred more than any man, any son of man that had, had lived. I mean, it says, I mean, he must not have even been recognizable at this point. It's a little bit, I mean, it kind of explains a little bit why, you know, people didn't recognize him right away when he rose from the dead, first of all. Because he was beaten beyond recognition at this point. And then in verse 15 it says, So shall he sprinkle many nations. The king shall shut their mouth at him. For that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. Turn to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, look at verse number 5. Explaining again the death of Jesus Christ and the purpose of it. In Isaiah 53 and verse number 5, the Bible says, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Look, he was horribly beaten near death. This, the Roman scourging, just, just look it up. Look up Roman scourging. This is not just being whipped. I mean, Roman scourging was it, that many times by itself killed the person. It would tear the, the flesh off of you. It was a horribly... The Romans were brutal people. You know, everybody... I mean, the Romans actually... One thing that little, it kind of annoys me a little bit about the Romans and Roman history is it's glorified a lot. It was a very brutal society. Right. And I'm going to show you a little bit more about that um, this evening. But look... Even after the death. So look, this was a terrible death. This was a terrible day. This was a terrible afternoon. This did not go quickly. It was a long suffering period for the Lord Jesus Christ. But, turn back to John 19. Even after the death, you know, there was more to be done. Okay? Let's look at the burial of Jesus Christ. Look at John 19 and verse number 38. And the Bible says this, and it says, And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave. So Jesus, as we just read, has, has, he's died on the cross. He has, he has died, and they take the body off the cross. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night. This is John chapter 3 right here. Okay, this is Nicodemus. And brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. This is to, you know, embalm the body. Then they took the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices, as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher, wherein never man yet laid. There laid they Jesus, be, be, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulchre was nigh at hand. So, Jesus was doing something now. He was dead, but this was not finished. There was something else that Jesus was now doing. His body was dead, turn to Acts chapter 2. Now, to those people that would say, I don't believe a God, I mean, how many times have you met these people that say, I don't believe in a God that would send people to hell? How many times have you met people like that? That say, you know, I don't, I don't believe in a mean God that would, that would damn people to hell. When you're out soul winning and you, you start off trying to explain that, you will find these people that believe this. You'll meet these people. But turn to Acts chapter 2. And let me disprove that God for you right now. 
Acts chapter 2. Let's start reading in verse number 25. And I know that Acts chapter 2 and verse number 31 is something that you very well know, but I want to explain the entire context of this and explain to you what Peter was actually explaining to these Jews that he was talking to here. And in verse number 25, the Bible says, For David, now this is Peter speaking on the day of Pentecost here. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. So he's saying, David foresaw the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to prove to you several times as well that the gospel of the Old Testament was the same gospel that these people believed here. Here's the first one. David foresaw the Lord. He foresaw the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to see. Put a finger in Psalm 16. We're going to head there next. But in Acts 26, or 20, uh, chapter 2 and verse 26, the Bible says, Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope. He's, he's quoting David here. Verse 27, Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. This is what Peter says. Therefore, being a prophet. He's saying David was being a prophet when he said these things. And knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that the fruit of his loins, this is the promise of David, that your, your kingdom will, will last forever into eternity. So David knew that that meant that the Messiah would come from him, from his physical line. That the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. You see, David knew it. David knew the means that God was going to use to take his, David's kingdom into eternity. He knew that he would raise up the Christ to sit on the throne of David. You see? And verse number 31, he seeing this before, so he said, David knew all this. David knew it. And he seeing this before, spake. When he spoke in verse 26 and verse 27, he spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Turn to Psalm 16. Here's what he's talking about. He's talking about Psalm 16, where the Jews knew Psalm 16. They knew this, this verse in the Bible. But he's explaining Psalm 16 to these Jews who were looking at Psalm 16 through a glass darkly. Okay? And look at Psalm 16. Look at verse number 9. And tell me if this sounds familiar. Psalm 16, verse number 9, the Bible says, Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. That looks a lot like verse number 26 of Acts chapter 2. Okay, and look, that one's not hard to understand. David says, my flesh is going to rest in hope. Amen. I mean, that makes sense. But now, if you just read Psalm 16, and you're a Jew, and you do not have Acts chapter 2, things get, could get a little confusing for you here. It says in, in verse number 10 of Psalm 16, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Well, who's he talking about? Who's he talking about here? So, Peter is explaining Psalm 16 to the Jews that he was talking about Jesus. He said, David saw the Christ. David knew that that was the promise that his kingdom would, would continue in eternity. I've, I've told you this many times. We've looked at the, the lineage of the kings of Judah, but David knew that the Christ would come from him and that what would, is what would take his kingdom to eternity. David knew it. Amen. And Acts chapter 2 tells us that. And then he tells us that because of the fact of verse 31, that he spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. Look what he says up in verse number 29 of Acts chapter 2. This proves it. He says, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he's dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. Look, he says that David's flesh did see corruption. We could go, he basically is saying, we could go look at his grave right now. We could go literally look upon his bones now. We could go look upon what the dust of David's body, his physical body, looks like. Now, he says their sepulchre is here. So he was speaking of Christ. Amen. 
that so the his in Acts 2:31 this proves is referring to Jesus. And the Jews looking at Acts 16 or Psalm 16 were just looking at a they were looking at a prophecy darkly. Not anymore. Now it's clear. Right? So look, this was not understood by the Jews until Peter explains it to them right here. So look, to believe that Je Jesus' soul went to hell for three days when he was in the grave. You either have to believe that, or you have to believe that Peter was wrong in Acts chapter 2. Pick one. It, it's very confusing to me on uh, why people don't understand this doctrine, but this is what Jesus was doing when his body was in the tomb. His soul was in hell. But the Bible says that it wasn't let, left there. And his, and his flesh would not see corruption. Jesus' flesh in the tomb. All right? Now, look, here's another note, and here's why a lot of people get confused on this doctrine. If you get away from the KJV, the King James Bible, I mean, all bets are off on this one. I mean, this, I mean, we don't even, it's not the point of the sermon. We don't have time to explain it. But this is where you get this doctrine of, different levels of hell, and certain Christians are going to go to hell, and there's a Sheol, and a Hades, and a Paradise. I mean, it's different versions of the Bible. That's where it comes from. Okay, and that's where things get really strange and confusing. So just stick to the King James Bible, Amen. once again. All right, so back to these people who don't believe in a God who would send people to hell. Look, he sent his own son there. He sent his own son there. So, yes, he's going to send people there. He sent his own son there, who is, by the way, your only chance to not go there. All right? So that's, that's the death and the burial of Jesus Christ. We understand that, that it's the, it's the propitiation, it's the payment for our sins. We get that. It's easy to understand. But let me ask you this. Why the resurrection? Why the resurrection? I mean, the, the sacrifice... The sacrifice was done. The payment, the appeasement, the propitiation was done. Turn to Colossians chapter 2. So I want to give you two reasons tonight for the resurrection. Two reasons for the resurrection. Two good reasons for the, for the resurrection. Turn to Colossians chapter 2 and look at verse number 13. Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 13. It's where the Bible says, And you, being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinance that was, ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Sound familiar? Now, so, so that's the first part, right? There's the, there's the payment right there in verse 14, blotting out. So that was the purpose of the death, the sacrifice, the, the payment in hell of what Jesus did. Blotting out the handwriting of the ordinances, it was nailed to the cross. He bare those sins in his own body on the tree. But then look at verse 15. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6. So he's saying that there's these principalities and powers, and he made an open show of them. He, he showed them up, so to speak. Tri and he triumphed over them. Look at Ephesians chapter 6, look at verse number 12. Where the Bible says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, this is talking about us, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness, where? At the local level? Against spiritual wickedness in high places. So where are you going to see the most wickedness? In the highest places. In the highest places of power. So look, the, the most wickedness is at the upper level of power in the world. We know that from the Bible. And guess who's at the top of that chain? Satan himself. Turn to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. It was for this, it was for this reason right here 
that the upper level powers in Jesus' time feared the resurrection. They feared the resurrection. You say, what do you mean they feared the resurrection? Let's look at it in Matthew chapter 27. They literally feared that he would come back from the dead. They, they were afraid of it. Look at verse, uh, Matthew 27 and verse number 59. Where the Bible says, And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it... A, laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewed out in a rock, and he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulchre and departed. And there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulchre. Now the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that the deceiver said, While he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulchre be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say unto the people, He has risen from the dead, so the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, You have a watch, go your way, make it as sure as you can. So they went, and they made the sepulchre sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. So the upper level powers of that day feared the resurrection of Christ. They feared that he would come back, or that even that his disciples would say that he came back. All right. Now look, the first point of the resurrection is this, is to prove the victory over the principalities and the power. To make a show of them openly. If he were to, look, if he were to rise again, it would, it would prove he said he was who he said he was. If he literally rose from the dead. I mean, can anybody else rise from the dead? No. Think of this. I mean, think of this. Turn to John chapter 12. But think of this. All of the miracles that Jesus did and these upper level spiritual leaders could not believe. The Bible says they could not believe. They couldn't believe. Turn to John chapter 12. Let's look at the Pharisees. Let's look at the Pharisees. Jesus has done all these miracles right in front of them. I mean, you ever think about that? John chapter 12, look at verse 37. The Bible says, But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him, that the saying of Esaias the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because the, that Esaias said again, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. Look, at, the, at a certain point, Jesus didn't even, want to, didn't even want the Pharisees to believe. He just hardened their heart. And they couldn't believe, the Bible says. These things said Esaias when he saw his glory and spake of him. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. So there was, there was a fringe of even the chief rulers that believed on him. But it says these certain group of Pharisees, the mainstream Pharisees, they didn't believe on him. And, and Jesus hardened their heart and they couldn't believe. So that, look, that's why that it didn't matter how many miracles Jesus did in front of them at, at a certain point. They just... Jesus hardened their heart at that point. Turn to Matthew 28. Even the resurrection itself, and they couldn't believe. Even the resurrection itself. Look at Matthew 28 and verse number 2. Now, I mean, picture the scene here in Matthew 28 and verse number 2. It says, and, I mean, so here's these, the, Pilate gave him the guard. He gave him the soldiers. There's, all the, there's Roman soldiers standing guard at the tomb. Okay, this is the scene. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. So here it is, this huge earthquake. This angel comes down from heaven, rolls this stone away and sits on the stone. And these Roman soldiers saw the whole thing. They saw it all. I mean, they were right there and they saw it. Look at verse 11, skip down. Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. They went and they told the chief priests and the Pharisees, and when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while he slept. So the thing that they feared, they actually said, they told Pilate that they feared that his disciples would steal him away, and then say he rose again. So the soldiers come and say, you know, this angel came, there's a huge earthquake, you know, they tell him this big supernatural event happens, and what is the first thing that the Pharisees say? Pay the guys off. They don't say, wow, he was who he said he was. They, they just say, pay the soldiers off. 
Right? Now look, the amazing thing here isn't the soldiers. Right? Because look, the typical, Ro just think about what the typical Roman soldier did to Jesus before his death. They didn't even know the guy. They, they just, the typical Roman soldier turned to Luke chapter 3. I mean, these Roman soldiers, they would just do anything for money. So this is what the Pharisees knew. They're just like, just pay him off. I mean, they knew Jesus was innocent. They went, out, they went out of their way to not just scourge him, but to, you know, beat him unmercifully. I mean, just think of this, how, what kind of sadistic person you need to be to make a crown of thorns and smash it onto somebody's head. And, and to torture somebody. I mean, they weren't told to do that. They were just these band of thugs. Just, that's just who they were. That's just who they were. That was the Roman soldier. Look at Luke chapter 3. This is John the Baptist talking to Roman soldiers. Verse number 12. Then came also publicans to be baptized and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? And he said unto them, Exact no more than that which is appointed to you. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, <laughs> and be content with your wages. So, John the Baptist knew that these were violent people. All right, so he wasn't telling them to fight in wars. The, the Roman soldiers were just violent. They were just violent, sadistic people, period. They would oppress, torture, and kill anyone that they were ordered to do, especially for money. I mean, after the Jewish persecution of the first few decades, it got really bad when it became Roman persecution. And that was executed by Roman soldiers, the persecution of Christians. So look, it's not really surprising here that the soldiers took the payoff and that the, the chief priests and the Pharisees knew to just pay them off. But it shows once again that the Pharisees literally could not believe. They did not have the ability to believe. There was no miracle. There was no miracle that Jesus could do that would make them believe. They were completely blinded. So the first reason for the resurrection is that Jesus claimed victory over all of them with the resurrection. Over all of the spiritual wickedness in high places throughout all history, past, present, and future. Why? You say, what do you mean throughout all history, past, present, and future? Because at the top of that chain, no matter who the wicked mortal leader is at that time, at the top is Satan. At the top is what John 12 would call the prince of this world. At the top is what 2 Corinthians chapter 4 would call the God of this world, Satan himself. So Jesus, with the resurrection, claimed that victory. That's good. Point number two. My final point tonight on the resurrection, what it proves and what it did for us is it proves God's promise to us. Turn to Matthew chapter 10. Turn to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, look at verse number 28. Where the Bible says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both body, both soul and body in hell. Look, turn to John chapter 11. We are... This same victory that Jesus promised, that Jesus achieved over the principalities and the powers, we are promised this same victory. Turn to John chapter 11. I'll prove it to you. Look at verse number 24. We see the story here of Lazarus. Lazarus has died and Jesus is going to rise, raise him from the dead. And Martha is sad and she is coming to Jesus and she's, she's, not, she's upset that her brother has died. Okay, And she says, Martha, in verse number 24 of John chapter 11, Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus says he will rise again. And she says, I know, Jesus, that he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said unto her, well, first of all, let me just say this. I find it interesting that Martha didn't have the New Testament. Jesus had not died. Here's another example of the gospel of the Old Testament being the exact same gospel of the New Testament. Martha did not have the New Testament. And she says to Jesus, she says, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Sounds a lot like what we believe. Look at verse 25. 
Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? And she said unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Sounds like she was waiting for a Christ. Amen. Sounds like she knew a Christ was coming. Amen. And sounds like she knew that she would be resurrected on the last day Amen. before she read the New Testament. And before Jesus had even died on the cross. Before Jesus had even risen from the dead. More proof that the Old Testament faith was the exact same faith as we have. Now look, look at verse 25. Jesus says unto her, I am the resurrection. Jesus is the resurrection. The resurrections that makes all other resurrections possible. Just like the one that Martha was referring to. Martha was referring to a resurrection that she was going to receive, that Lazarus was going to receive. So Jesus, but here's a funny thing. Jesus talks about the resurrection when he says, I am the resurrection. He talks about it like it's already happened. Isn't that strange to say, I am the resurrection? But look, turn to John chapter 8. Jesus did this. Jesus talked like this in more than one occasion. And I'll explain to you why. Look at John chapter 8 and verse 58. You guys were just talking about this the other night. John chapter 8 and verse number 58. All the Jews were talking about being, uh, you know, a children, children of Abraham and all this. And Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was... I am. Jesus says that before Abraham even existed, I am. But he says, I am, like, like it's now. Like before Abraham even existed, I, I, I was. I am. You see, turn to Revelation chapter 13. And I'm going to read for you 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19 and 20, where the Bible says, you turn to Revelation 13, the Bible says, but without with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. So Jesus was foreordained before the foundation of the world was even laid. Before the world was even created, Jesus was foreordained. He was manifest in Jesus Christ in his body in, at this time, when he's standing by um, in the New Testament. Look at Revelation 13.8. And all that dwelt upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So the Bible says that from the foundation of the world, it was like Jesus was already slain. Isn't that funny that God talks that way? How can God talk that way? How can God talk like before the, the world was even created? Before the foundation of the world was even created, Jesus was, was like he was already slain. I mean, look, this, this, it was like to God, it was like it was already done. Before the world was even created. This should give us, by the way, added faith to the word of God. Because God says something. First of all, the Word of God, we've already studied this, the Word of God was, was already complete before the foundation of the world as well. Before it was written down for us on these nice pages and this nice bound Bible, it was already done. So it was like all this had already happened. In God's eyes, it, it had already happened. You see? To God, the plan was as good as done before the foundation of the world was laid. So Jesus could rightly say, I am the resurrection before he even resurrected in the eyes of us. Amen. You see? So he was the resurrection. He could say, I am the resurrection. Because he is, what he, what he was saying is, I am the resurrection, is what he was saying to Martha. I am the resurrection. It's, it's already done. It's like it's already finished. Because that's how God operates. The word's already done. The plan's already done. It's already executed to God. And he says, I am the resurrection that will create all and make all these resurrections, including yours, possible. Amen. And he says, how do you get that resurrection? By believing on me. Amen. If you believe on me, you will have that resurrection that I make possible through my resurrection. Amen. You see? That's... The second reason for the resurrection is it proves 
that we have that same promise. We will have that same resurrection because Jesus is the resurrection that makes ours possible. He proved it to us. He proved it to us. Turn to Romans 8, chapter 11. <clears throat> Look, to God, if it's in the Word, it's already done. God transcends time. You say, I don't understand that. You don't have to. All you have to do is just believe what's in the Bible because God has proven over and over and over to us that what is in the Word of God will come to pass. Amen. Romans 8, 11, just a little tidbit. Just a, this, this, will be two, this will be reason 2A. The Bible is proof, that the resurrection is proof that the Holy Spirit is in us. Look at Romans 8, chapter, uh, verse number 11, where the Bible says, But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. So look, you, when you got saved, so look, do you have to have the Spirit dwelling in you in order to be, get that resurrection? The Bible says yes. Because that is the Spirit that raised Jesus up from the dead. It's the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead, and that's why when you get saved, when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says that you are sealed by that Holy Spirit of promise. You are indwelled by the Holy Spirit, and that same Spirit will raise you up from the dead in that resurrection. So look, folks, we don't serve a God that is all talk, that is all words. He has proved everything to us on this earth already. I mean, from the proof of creation that he talks about in Romans, to the proof, proof of the invisible things of God, to the proof of Jesus' actual perfect life on earth, from the miracles to, the, to the, just the dramatic, traumatic death of Jesus Christ to the burial and then to the most historically significant event in history which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ Amen. it proves the victory over Satan that's the reason for the resurrection and then it proves of our it proves our access to that same victory that resurrection if we just believe on him that's that is the beauty of the resurrection. That we don't have a God that just says things. He's a God of action. And He took action through His Son, and He has taken that action. He has proved everything that He said that He would do in His Word, and He proved it through Jesus Christ. He proved it through the death, the burial, and the resurrection. So look, Happy Easter, everyone. I mean, He is, he is risen. You know, and celebrate your victory through His resurrection this Easter. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, um, we thank You for this wonderful day. Um, we thank You for um, just the gift of Your Son. Lord, we thank You for um, just taking this action for us. Lord, we, act, we ask that, you know, just, just help us to never forget the action that you, you came and you interceded for this world and you gave us this perfect sacrifice that anyone has access to, Lord. And help us know, you know, when we go out soul winning, that anybody has access to this, Lord, and help us be clear in presenting that gospel and telling this story and this, this great um, sacrifice that you made for all the people that are alive today and that will be alive in the future. Help us never to forget this, Lord. We thank you. We love you. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.